up here. Um, love to, to hear from some folks in the audience. What's, what's brought you here? What's gotten you excited about XR accessibility? I know we have our mic runners around somewhere here. Anybody want to share their uh, share their experience while they're here today? Yeah, hello. My uh, name is Nicholas Wern. I'm coming here from Sweden, and I specialize in digital twins and IoT and all these kind of things. And I, for me, it's extremely rewarding uh, because this is exactly what I need in terms of the smart buildings, smart cities, and you know, make this inclusive for all. You know, from from the beginning, not just as an afterthought. And uh, I think, like, I don't know, Christine, maybe. In the last call, just to the importance on context and capturing that, because I think like I've been working with this methodology that a lot of companies in a lot of industries they take data and then they try to go to information, then try to go to insight, and then to action, action, and then that leads to an outcome. Never happens. Uh, data is getting stuck in information. In information, never leads to any insight, and the question is insight for whom. And what I'm working more is, you know, going from an outcome, intended outcome, and then going backwards. And for that, you need context and you need explainable context. So I think, you know, I'm really, really, you know, super interested in all these kind of things because I've been working with smart buildings for 10, 20 years. And accessibility, inclusivity, I think there was uh, Joel that said, you know, I haven't thought about it too much. Right, so I think this is really important, and I mentioned that also in the chat. You know, a little bit off topic, but maybe even more on topic. That my grandma, she was working with, um, you know, interpretation for the people who are uh, deaf and blind, and I always thought that it was extremely fascinating how you could do that with sign language in someone's hand. So, anyway, I'm I'm super interested. You know, it's great to be here. I love to talk about all these kind of things. So, just appreciative for uh, taking the initiative to be here. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I think we're just about ready to go, so I'll hand it off to Jasmine Peter. Thank you. Yes? Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm hungry. I'm sure you're all hungry, too, so we'll try to go fast and get you all out to lunch. So thank you for being here. We're very excited to share our talk with you today. So welcome to Loud and Clear, Improving Accessibility for Low Vision Players in Cosmonius High. I'm Jasmine Cano, the Accessibility Product Manager at Alchemy Labs. My role consists of research, design, playtesting, and production. And I'm Peter Galbraith. I'm the Senior Accessibility Engineer at Alchemy Labs. I do design and engineering and implementing uh, a lot of the features that uh, you're going to see us talk about today. So I'd like to first start by showing a short video to introduce people to Cosmonius High if you haven't heard of it. OM Galaxies, you will not believe what's happening at Cosmonius High. So we need first contact with a whole new species, a Prismi, and they're coming to our school. But get this, the space bus crashed, the AI is being super weird, the principal is in a total panic, Glug thinks it's the end of the world. Well, I guess that's normal. The Prismi keeps adapting new power. And crystals? And tornado wind power? <laughs> I have a uh, wind power from my butt. Anyway, the school's filled with space dust, surprise extra credits, giant meteors. There's a something under the bleachers. I'm a substitute teacher. Right. And there's clubs everywhere. What would our school's founder think of all this chaos? The perils of the so-called real world can wait. Hank, it's time for class. Oh, gotta go. See you at Cosmonius High. <laughs> so, that's uh, Cosmonius High. It's a uh, immersive uh, game where you play as an alien uh, in an alien high school who adapts new powers and uses these powers to solve problems throughout the school. And today we're going to talk about the vision accessibility update. So the update came with a lot of features. There is a lot of work that went into this, but mainly what we added was a vision assistance mode 
When a player toggles this mode on, they can expect a lot like object highlighting, haptic feedback, tutorial narration, and object descriptions. And we'll go over plenty of these in this talk. And a quick look at our development timeline. We kicked off the development in May of last year, and we worked on it uh, through the end of 22. However, in September, we started our external playtesting. And then in January of this year, our QA team jumped into the game to test everything. And in the trailer, you could see there are many classrooms, lots of objects, and that took some time, but thankfully our team is awesome and great, and they were able to hear every description of every object. And then in March of this year, we launched the update. So today's talk, we're going to talk about how the project started, the development of the features, playtesting, the final version, and additional considerations for you all. And we hope that you leave here today with ways to improve your vision accessibility in your products. And remember, this doesn't have to be for just games. Exactly. This is, uh, we have a very dense game with a lot of object interactions and a lot of player freedom. So this works for a lot of virtual worlds as well. Uh, so uh, we're excited to tell you about it. So we'll start from the beginning. Uh, how did we get started on this? Well, we first started by asking ourselves, what would this experience uh, be like for, uh, if it were accessible to uh, blind people and people with low vision? Uh, this was sort of our core uh, question that we structured everything around. Uh, this did come as an update uh, after the launch of our game, and we had had some inclination that we might do this uh, throughout the process, um, but it wasn't until after that we really solidified that, yes, this is an experiment that we're going to tackle and see if we can uh, challenge the notion that VR is only for sighted folks. So in November the previous year, our team consulted with Steve Saylor, who some of you may know as Blind Gamer Steve. And from that consultation, this list of target features were created. So the first one was to have descriptions for every object in the game. Also, settings for how the text-to-speech would sound adding environment descriptions, sound effects to stationary items, teleportation audio, descriptions for cinematic events, and auto-orienting players to face significant objects. From here, we were able to create our sort of core goals for the experiment. Uh, we wanted to create the mode for, that would enable people with vision impairments to play our game, uh, and we wanted to really focus in on uh, AOM, the accessibility object model, uh, so that every object in the environment could have descriptive text that could be read via a text-to-speech system, uh, similar to how content is read uh, via screen readers. In our game, we added a page to a backpack that a player has access to at any point in the game. So they can toggle this mode on and off, and on that page, we also added some light tutorialization to learn how to use these features. The toggle is also available in the first scene you enter into in the game on the desk directly in front of the player. And additionally, uh, the player can raise the controller to their ear and double tap an assist button, uh, platform specific. Uh, and uh, that will also enable the mode. So even if uh, the player cannot see uh, where the toggle is in the world. Uh, they can use their own body location to help them uh, turn this mode on. So uh, next is, I'm sorry, I'm sorry about that. Um, one moment. Uh, so next we're going to get into how we began uh, developing all of these features. Uh, what we did first uh, when we started developing was analyze our initial uh, design and what we already had in the game. 
Uh, so we were very fortunate that many of our previous uh, design choices gave us a head start. Uh, much of our content was already uh, low vision friendly. We had large text in our game. We had bright colors for objects and clear silhouettes, some object highlighting that really helped uh, identify objects. So this was a great boon to start us off with. Um, additionally, we have a system uh, that's called the World Item System that provided most items in the game uh, with a name and short description already. So when it came time and we began implementing the uh, text-to-speech solutions, uh, technically, we were able to hook right into that system and uh, already have a massive amount of uh, content cap uh, captioned in the game, or I guess read. Uh, uh, additionally, we had known that this was an experiment that we were interested in doing and had reserved a button on every controller on the platforms uh, that we support to uh, act as an assist button that we then uh, will be using for this update so that there is a discrete and consistent uh, input for uh, accessing many of the features that you'll see in the moment. Uh, so once we started, once we had analyzed all of that, we started development. And one of the first things that we developed was a vision simulation tool. Uh, we made it so that the uh, player could, inside the headset, turn on these modes uh, that would simulate color blindness, uh, blurred vision in multiple uh, levels of severity, and even uh, total vision loss. Uh, this was great for having our sighted developers uh, go through and uh, catch obvious issues early on uh, and really helped with in making our iteration time fast. Um, but we also recognize that this is absolutely not a substitute for uh, testing with disabled users uh, and uh, people that needed additional assistance. So with external testing, we connected with players who were legally blind and had low vision. And I want to share a look into the way we did that. So we partnered with VR Oxygen for accessibility testing. We conducted these remote play tests over video calls with players who were all around the country so we could get different perspectives. And we got to watch and hear them play the game. We also got to watch their screen. So I'd see them, see the screen, and then get a feel for how they were playing the game. And I want to share a quick story. There was a play tester who had played Cosmonius High before. Unfortunately, he only played for a couple minutes. And that's because of a barrier he faced pretty much right away. So the good news is that when he played our game with these features, he was able to scan the area where he had faced a barrier before. Using his hand, hearing the names of the objects, he found the key that was needed to put into the school bus, get to school, and go to class. And he went to class and completed a few assignments. And that was just awesome to see that this update really helped. So yeah, this helped us know when we were on the right track, and then when we were making good design choices. And also when we were making design choices that weren't quite there. Uh, one of the first uh, times that we had this was our initial design uh, wasn't using the uh, assist button yet. When you scanned your hand over objects, uh, it would automatically play uh, information about those objects. This quickly became uh, apparent as a problem because when you have two hands and both things are trying to talk to you simultaneously and, how, and, if, and in such a dense environment as we have with our interactions, uh, it was very cacophonous and just very hard for uh, players to understand what was happening. Uh, so for a better experience, we uh, allowed players to choose when they get their, uh, uh, the text-to-speech read aloud. Um, 
And we do that using that assist button where now when a player hovers their hand over an object, which they can feel when that happens via a slight haptic, uh, we uh, allow them to tap the button and they can get uh, feedback uh, on that object. Additionally, they can hold the uh, assist button down and scan their hand over it to uh, get a quick uh, idea of what is around them uh, and sort of have that in a more controlled and player influenced uh, way. So now we'll talk about the way we formatted our object descriptions. We have the name of the object read first, followed by a description of what the object is. And then if there's text on the object, that will be read out as well. Uh, we had some jokes and some puns early on. And while some play testers enjoyed hearing these, it was suggested that we maybe add them towards the end with a bit of a pause between the important information and then any additional words we wanted to have in there. And yeah, the advice was to look at the way people should be writing alt text for images on the web. So that was sort of the standard we were looking at for writing these descriptions. In the end, we eventually did remove the joke text uh, from the descriptions uh, and only focused on the visual and mechanical descriptions of the objects uh, after their names. Another place we have descriptions is on our icons. So in the game, players can communicate with other characters. And the way that they can communicate with characters is by selecting emojis from a speech bubble. So those have descriptions as well. That way, players can know, you know what they want to tell the character when a character asks them a question. They'll make meaningful choices. Uh, as I said, describing the mechanical information in addition to the visual information is also important. Uh, I think we heard in a talk earlier today about how players wanted uh, contextual information about what was happening and not just uh, purely the visual information. Uh, and for us, uh, that was especially important in this environment where there are alien tools and things that don't necessarily replicate real life, uh, but are fantastical in some way. Uh, so it was important for us to have uh, ways to have dynamic text that would react to uh, what the player was saying. In the image uh, on the right here, uh, there's a fluid dispenser uh, where you can select different fluids. Uh, and it's not enough to describe that this is a fluid dispenser. It's important to know which uh, fluid is currently selected and uh, having that all update dynamically. We also did that for things like the backpack zipper uh, to make sure that the players could get to the uh, pages that they would like to get to, uh, and a few other places throughout the game. I want to add to that previous slide real quick. Uh, yeah, during play tests, sometimes I would hear people say, oh, fluid dispenser, how do I use this? And then our description would tell them, and that made them smile, which made me smile as well. <laughs> Um, another real uh, difficult challenge for us was our teleportation descriptions. Uh, we wanted players to be able to navigate the environment uh, as easily as they could um, without compromising uh, on comfort uh, that we sometimes see uh, be an issue with uh, sliding locomotion and things like that in VR. Uh, so, uh, we wanted to keep teleportation. So what we did uh, to make this work was we hand authored uh, a bunch of zones that when the player is pointing their uh, controller uh, to teleport uh, at, they will hear the text-to-speech read back what the name of that zone is. And if they're not pointing at a specific zone area, it will also inform them that they are only near a zone. Um, and this helps players build a uh, mental map. And when, you, uh, when the player scans around with their hand, there's also a slight haptic to know 
uh, to let them know uh, when the uh, boundaries are crossed there and to listen for what uh, the uh, new area is. Additionally, we uh, once the teleport actually occurs after aiming, um, we read off the information again to let them know that they have actually arrived in the position that they were and that they didn't, you know, wiggle their hand too much uh, in the release of the button. Uh, here's a picture of those zones. This is our uh, registration, the first scene that you load into. There's areas uh, before, like in front of the desk and behind the desk. Uh, there's areas in the bus. All of these little green uh, squares are the areas. And uh, we end up picking the closest uh, zone if you're uh, not there and saying, oh, you're near the registration desk or you're near the entrance to the bus. Um, and we authored all a bunch of these throughout the game. Uh, and took a lot of manual work, but I think it's definitely worth it. Yeah, we saw in playtesting, people would go near where they should go, like go to the desk. But sometimes people would go behind the desk and not know that they were behind. So these descriptions, like letting them know they're behind something or letting them know they're in front or to the side, that's way more helpful and can help them navigate the game without feeling lost. So we put a lot of effort into these descriptions, and it's really important to prioritize what it is that players hear first. So when we do that, when an object description is read out loud, we lower the volume of everything else. In this game, there are characters who talk to the player, characters that talk to other characters, and it's also hard to predict when they're going to speak. And then additionally, there are sounds in the environment. And all of this going on at the same time isn't the most comfortable, so we do some audio ducking there. Yeah, when, when the player requests uh, audio, uh, uh, text-to-speech audio and information about an object, we lower the volume of uh, the other things in the scene, prioritizing this information that the player wanted to have. Having both at the same volume uh, proved to be very difficult to understand, and having the uh, player requested information lowered uh, didn't respect their choice to ask that. So it's very important that we were ducking that audio there. Yeah, it's important that when a player requests a description that it's loud and clear. Uh, additionally, we worked with, uh, we added spatial audio to uh, our uh, objects. So when you're scanning an object maybe from far away or aiming uh, at a teleport zone further out, uh, we initially had it so that it realistically reflected uh, the volume that uh, was there uh, or of if, it, if there was a speaker there. Um, we quickly found that that didn't really work in a realistic sense because things that were far away uh, were a little too quiet to hear often. Uh, or if we raised those sounds, it would make uh, the stuff that was close really way too loud. So uh, we, and additionally, not all platforms that we were working on supported uh, dynamic text-to-speech that was spatialized. So. Uh, for the platforms that did, we did uh, basically modify our volume curve so that uh, things that were further away were a little louder and uh, a little less realistic, but still gave players a sense of how uh, far away an object is, whether or not it's close or far at least. So additionally, now uh, we want to show what the trailer was for uh, the release of this uh, feature set. So.
At Alchemy Labs, our guiding principle is VR for everyone, and that means everyone should enjoy our games, regardless of any disabilities or limitations that players may face. Our upcoming vision accessibility update will bring all new features to make the experience more inclusive for fans both old and new. Some of these can even prove helpful to players who might not usually take advantage of accessibility features. You'll have access to audio descriptions from the very start of your time at Cosmonius High, and you can activate them through a handy toggle here or in your backpack at any time. New students can access animated tutorials with audio descriptions that offer visual and auditory guidance. Background sounds and dialogue volume are lowered to avoid conflicting with assistive audio. Push forward on your thumbstick and point around the space to hear the places you can teleport to, then let go of the thumbstick to teleport. With teleportation descriptions, players can now hear the names of locations in order to make an informed decision before teleporting. Space Bus Door Space Bus Interior Our environmental descriptions give players context about the world that they're playing and moving around in. This feature is particularly helpful for players who may not be able to see certain details or who may need additional information to fully engage with the game world. You are in the registration area for Cosmonius Hot, near you. There is a desk displaying a shelf with five student IDs and a glowing platform to the right of the shelf. An intercom is mounted above a window in the back of the room. Not only can players move around Cosmo's world with greater confidence, they can interact with greater reassurance. Pointing at stirring rod, pale blue stir stick with a ball shape at one end. Object highlighting will help those with limited vision to see the general location of an object with a bright outline around items as you approach them. When you've selected an item, you can get audio and haptic feedback confirming when an item has been successfully grabbed or released. Grab pet snack, a delicious snack for a fish, a blub, or you. And finally, object descriptions. This assistive audio feature acts like a screen reader, but in virtual reality. In VR, rather than using a cursor, players can use their hands to control what's read about an object. These helpful audio descriptions can inform players about individual objects, as well as read book covers, pages, and the many flyers around the school. Follow this formula to create cyan plus magenta plus gold. This can be great for any player who forgets the difference between a bleb and a babana. And those are some of the groundbreaking accessibility features coming to the game. We hope you'll find them useful in your journey to save Cosmonius High. So just one month after the launch of this update, we saw over one and a half million total requests, and that's just coming from Quest 2 data. And these requests are basically any time a player uh, puts their hand over an object, uh, the text-to-speech that comes back is considered a request in this. So 1.53 million uh, people, or uh, not people, sorry, 1.53 million uh, items have been scanned effectively. And that was just in the first month and only on that one platform. So we're on also uh, PlayStation VR 2 and uh, Steam as well. So uh, this is just a small slice of those numbers. Small slice, it's a huge I number. Mean, it's yeah. so exciting. <laughs> There's even more. That's all I'm saying. Oh, totally. <laughs> um, but there are some things that we didn't uh, get to in this uh, and would have liked to and would like to see in the future and maybe try and uh, do. Uh, so some of those things that we'd like to see would be additional uh, audio customization options, being able to change the voice and the speed of the uh, text-to-speech. Um, we also would have liked to have had more uh, in the way of character description so that players could scan and get information about the characters in the game. Uh, some of our side puzzles also are still challenging to do uh, with limited vision, uh, and we would like to see a more uh, fleshed out world in the future and in your future projects as well. Uh, additionally, uh, a radar ping, uh, as we described it, was something that we had started work on, but uh, recognized there needed to be more uh, work done and wanted to get this out as soon as possible. But we wanted something where the players could press a button and uh, hear objects around the scene so that they know where to start looking for objects, where to point at and get that information. Um, we've seen some of that in other games like Last of Us 2 and things like that. Uh, additionally, guided navigation is something that was requested 
um, but was very challenging for us uh, given the nature of our game being uh, largely open-ended and non-linear. So, uh, but it would be wonderful if players could uh, know where they're going in more linear experiences and be uh, oriented or directed that way, whether it's through visual, uh, high uh, contrast visual cues or audio cues. So we're nearing the end here. And what I wanna do is let you all know that we wanna make VR for everyone and we want all of you to join us. So that's why we made this update. We gotta to try to remove barriers and ideally prevent barriers as well. So join us in advocating for accessibility everywhere you can. We want more teams to create accessible content. And for that, developers will need software that's accessible and also provide tools that lets teams add accessibility to their projects. We also want to see hardware become more accessible as well. And with increased accessibility in the industry, we'll see more adoption of XR. Absolutely. <laughs>